Now I'd like to introduce uh, Fatima Doyen. Um, the script I have in front of me says she used to be a Girl Scout, which is a bit scary. Um, in, the, in the United States, they're called Girl Scouts. Here, they're Girl Guides. The girl Guides, yes. Yeah, but in the States, girl they're, guides, girl, yes. they're Girl Scouts. Um, <laughs> uh, she's also the author of children's books um, and trained in the Montessori teaching method and put it into practice. So until recently, it was running the um, Manara, um, it's called Manara? Manara Academy. Yeah, yeah Manara Academy in Leicester, um, which I hope to restart again soon. So um, we're looking forward to her presentation on I suppose, the Montessori method. That's right, thank you. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for coming. I, um, I wanted to, I think, what I'd like to do is a play, I think it's a five minute video that gives an overview and action of, of some things, because I have some little photos where it doesn't show the movement and action. So since we've been talking about movement and action, I thought it'd be quite nice to start out with that, because that will then help you focus on what I'm going to present after that in the slides, inshallah. So this is, um, because in our school a lot of parents are sensitive about having photos of their children taken. I don't have the same kind of range of photographs you know, and so you can see something, uh, a classroom that's, or various classrooms that are in action. So if you can first show that. Okay. And this is a primary age classroom, so elementary, so we've moved on from early years. And this would be a six plus class. So you need to take two of four fifths, right? And it's not very deep. these words around. How would you read that, that phrase now? Imagine a school where children can progress at their own pace, regardless of their ability, where each child is provided the opportunity to make decisions about what she wants to know and when to move on to another subject. Imagine a school that teaches every subject with hands-on materials allowing children to absorb information using all their senses. Imagine a school that is a true community of learners, where children actually teach and learn from each other, as well as the adult, and assume their share of responsibility for maintaining the classroom environment. In the next few minutes, we will visit six Montessori elementary schools that offer children all of these opportunities. Come into these classrooms and observe how these schools engage the minds of children, regardless of background or ability. As we watch these children work, we will introduce you to some of the basic elements of elementary Montessori schools, including hands-on materials, multi-age learning communities, cooperative learning, self-paced, self-initiated learning, uninterrupted work time, and respect and appreciation of other cultures and classmates. All Montessori classrooms are based on a hands-on approach to learning. The materials that teach math, science, geography, language arts, geometry, and other subjects are carefully designed to appeal to the child's imagination rich colors and pleasing textures, thoughtfully assembled, invite each child to take the materials from the shelf. As the child becomes comfortable with the basics of math, the materials become increasingly abstract and complex, helping the learner to understand first the patterns of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and then building to the complexities of squaring and square root, cubing and cube root. Six 
These 12-year-olds are tackling a math problem that calls for the addition of the components of a cube. At this level, the materials provide a method for the students to check their own work, as well as a way to visualize the problem in three dimensions. So Montessori introduces children to geometry beginning in the early childhood years. The repetition encourages children to assume responsibility for their own learning, creating a greater self-confidence as they recognize and correct their own errors. And Maria Montessori really emphasized the teacher not dictating what the child learns, but that the child can find out for themselves more as they guide their learning. Learning math through the stamp game or the, or the beads and language through the, you know, the big black triangle for nouns, for parts of speech, those all give very tangible representations of what may be not a concrete thing. What are the three articles that we use? A and the. The parts of speech are represented by symbols in elementary Montessori. Each symbol was chosen to provide cues to the function of each word. We're going to learn a new grammar symbol today, and in order to do that, I'm going to show you this. What do I have here in my hand? A ball. The notion of the verb is introduced with a red ball, full of action and motion. And I think that is really great when you're so young to have that when, you know, young people are so visual and very hands-on. What are you? I hope that gave you um, some impressions of uh, some schools in action where you see there's lots of activities going on, there's a lot of movement going on, it's multisensorial, it's a lot of the things that we've been talking about today because I believe that the things, um, some of these things are, are quite useful not just in the early years but the ability to move, the opportunity to move, to make some choices about learning in a structured environment um, are very useful until children get to the teenage years, actually. So it goes from, progresses from concrete materials, as you see in the back there, all early years, to more abstract things as they get older, and finally get into full abstraction. So it's a gradual process. Right then. So we're going to talk about uh, Montessori and um, also Montessori and Islam. So first we'll look at Montessori in itself, and then we can compare Montessori and Islam as we're going. Right, okay. So um, I set up Monara Education um, five years ago, a community interest company, and with the aim of promoting holistic approaches to Islamic education and parenting, academic excellence and virtue in young people, and green sustainable lifestyles, among which one of our programs was uh, Monara Academy. And so that was through educational programs for children and young people, and um, parenting classes, teacher training, we've had Montessori teacher training, uh, community outreach, especially in our environmental um, work, and inshallah publishing educational resources. So this is an intention. And my story starts a long time ago. So um, this, it's been a very long path coming to my coming here to speaking to you. Uh, I do come from a family of educators. Um, several people in my family were teachers, and so I was experimented on from when I was a baby. I was the eldest grandchild, teacher baby to read, you know, all sorts of things that were, were cool in, in the 60s or were, were tried on me, you know. So, um, and, and education was part of the talk that I grew up with. So I guess, although I, for a period of time, left that, I ended up returning to that. And uh, that's, it's, been, it's been good. Um, I was able, uh, as a result of moving from New York to New Mexico, New York having had a very advanced school system, and New Mexico being quite a few years behind at the, the age that I moved in 1974, um, being able to move into a special alternative school called Freedom High School because I couldn't fit with the other schools, and this is sometimes a problem with children. And Freedom High School enabled me to go to school half a day and uh, to have more choices about what I was learning, and then to, to go home in the afternoon and do projects. And that was a kind of the beginning of my own journey educationally, and that was very good. And I was able to graduate from high school at the age of 16 instead of the normal age of 18, because I was able to take classes out in the community, I was able to, to do things I wanted to do that I was very interested in, and I felt that sense of empowerment from being able to make my own choices about some of the things I wanted to study. And so the sense of the idea of giving children more choice and then, then having increased motivation and then making more educational progress 
um, is something that those things are linked, and, and they're very personal for me. Um, now, I ended up, um, after uh, embracing Islam, uh, I ended up in a community in New Mexico, the Dar al-Islam community in Abiquiu. Uh, there was just a project um, right around the time I became a Muslim in 1979 that they just bought this land and they were going to make this wonderful Muslim community and they were going to have a school. And so I became involved in this school um, and that was my first <laughs> wonderful uh, school. It was right in the middle of nature and a uh, wonderful environment there for children to grow up. Uh, it was a very inspirational uh, background. Um, and there were a series of teacher training workshops there. And but there was one in particular where the very high profile educators came, Sayyid Hussein Nasser and uh, a, a variety of people came and, and did a, an intensive program talking about Islamic philosophy of education and how that could be brought into the curriculum. Um, now, I worked in Muslim schools and weekend schools um, in a variety of places. And what I found that is over the years, there has been less of an interest or a focus on understanding the philosophical underpinnings of Islamic education and more about the schools for Muslims and where they become, I would say, a segregated kind of entity where there's a, there's kind of, there's a cultural uh, aspect of the school, but the, the educational aspect of the school is very much based on whatever the local school is, plus let's add some Islamic subjects to that. And I have uh, long believed that that was not the solution and I, I think that it can be problematic to isolate communities and then not use a model that is in harmony with an Islamic ethos generally. So, and then I started noticing, well, I was doing my, um, I did a master's degree at Roehampton, and what was interesting to, to me was that we had then a second crop, I guess, um, in the late 90s and then 2000, um, of, of Muslim schools that were claiming that they were Islamic schools and that their method was the Islamic method of the alternative schools. So there was like, there were suddenly, there were Islamic Steiner schools, Islamic Montessori schools, Islamic neoclassical education, classical education, and various people were saying, well, classical education is the Islamic way, or, you know, uh, Montessori education is the Islamic way, or Steiner. And these are actually, on the surface, quite different looking approaches to education. And so why are people saying this, and what are the underpinnings? And, and that was what I was interested in exploring. Um, is there a Western um, holistic approach education that is intrinsically more Islamic than another one? And if so, what would that be? <laughs> okay, and for what reasons would that be? And let's just come up with some real facts rather than just a few little quotes and just scanning the surface. So that's what I looked into. And eventually I, I became convinced that of the different uh, methods that exist, that the Montessori was most similar although I wouldn't say it's a perfect match, but I find it's most similar. And there's a number of reasons, and I'll talk about that in detail um, later. And also Montessori has the flexibility to incorporate other aspects like class, like aspects of classical education. There's quite, actually quite a lot of overlap, and that's because all the different methods of holistic education do have certain things in common. And so there's that overlap, and um, one can borrow between them. Okay. So, if we want to say, what is holistic education, because that's what Montessori is a form of, then we look at a couple of different quotes uh, involving the transformation of the student at all levels. So it's a transformative model of education. So we're talking about the physical, cognitive, psychological, social, emotional, and spiritual aspects of education. We're looking at the development then of the whole child. And we're looking at the transformation of the whole child as he's going through these stages of development, okay? And these different models of education, they all insist on the total growth of each person. So whoever you look at in the holistic educational model, they'll say, well, the whole child is important. The whole person is important, and the whole lifestyle of the person is, you know, the whole life cycle is important, so they're not just looking at a little aspect in time. And I like this quote from Zafar Iqbal, who has a wonderful, his wife runs a wonderful school in Canada, in Edmonton. Um, they have a book called Concentric Circles, which is a fascinating book about education. The process of transformative learning is built upon the recognition that the inner resources given to each learner by the creator are the greatest asset in the process of learning. Transformative learning is to instill in the hearts and minds of learners a vision of life 
and the cosmos that transforms them in the very process of learning, the curriculum should have an inner unity. So the idea that it's not just information being poured into this child, like you have a bucket, you know, model where the, the child is the empty vessel and you're pouring knowledge in. The idea is that the child is built with, has intrinsic things that they know, the instinct, things that have to come out and be developed and brought out of the child and actually if you left the child alone, they will learn an awful lot of things on their own. Um, and I think that this is ignored by people oftentimes. Um, and I'll have, you know, Muslims will object and say, well, you know, the children shouldn't be teaching yourself, themselves, you know, knowledge is, is transmitted. Yes, knowledge, you know, religious knowledge is transmitted, but no one said you have to transmit the knowledge in this authoritarian or authoritative way about washing dishes, about doing, you know, uh, <laughs> weaving, about, about mathematics. These are, these are sciences which are not transmitted. They have to be grasped and understood. So the active process of learning is very important. So yes, if you're talking about, you know, religious principles, no, the child is not going to discover it in the, them you know, themselves on their own. They have to be transmitted from one teacher to the other. If you're talking about knowledge like geography, you know, like math, um, grammar and things, these are not revealed sciences. So there are other ways of learning. So each, each kind of knowledge has its own best way of learning it. So a lecture is not the best way to learn how to wash dishes, but imitation and direct experiences. And so that's the difference. I think people are getting confused about that. So I want to bring that in early on. Okay. So if we look at different ways that people use the term holistic education, we consider the development of the whole child at a given moment in time, so all of their capacities. So during a particular school year, for instance, their spiritual, physical, socio-emotional, aesthetic, and cognitive development, and their whole being. But we can also look at holistic over time, so giving due consideration to what's needed at the different stages of childhood and adult life, and the changes that occur in the person's capacity to learn the way they can best learn. We can look at the holistic curriculum in terms of talking about the curriculum itself as moving from the whole to the parts. And I think this is a feature that you oftentimes find where you're giving the great overview of something and then having the child engaging in you know, different aspects of that whole. Um, not losing sight of the greater context. And then you have the sense of providing a broad liberal education with an awareness of the interconnectedness of all subjects, that subjects are not isolated from each other, but they're actually all connected to life and to each other, and that you can have a connection between art and mass, and between mass and geography, between geography and, and uh, English, and between English, because when they're taught as very separate subjects which are completely not to do with each other, then that creates a, a misunderstanding of, of the reality of, of life in the world. Okay? And this, when, when you look at these factors, in many ways, a holistic approach to education is radically different, substantially different from conventional methods of education, no matter what conventional method you want to talk about. So the factory model of education is quite different from these things that we're talking about here. Okay. So when we look at Islam and holism, and I think that oftentimes non-Muslims are, are surprised to think there could be a connection between holistic education and Islamic uh, philosophy or educational philosophy, um, we have to understand that Tawheed, or the sense of the unity of God, is at the center of the Islamic worldview, oneness of God. And to make one, Tawheed to make one, it leads to the unity of knowledge. And to understand, sorry, that should be the main different forms and disciplines of knowledge are ultimately one, and that they all connect us to some aspects of God's creation, and therefore as a means of knowing Him, our Creator. So that, that's the connection, philosophically, between holistic educational methods and um, Islamic uh, understanding of the worldview of, of Islam. Okay, and understanding that human beings have been honored by God. Um, honored by Allah SWT to be his khalifas, uh, stewards, representatives on earth, and are in a position of responsibility. So that we're responsible for knowing all about the creation and taking care of it. And uh, here we have a quote from Imam Ghazali, you know, the this, this, this sense that there's knowledge that's intrinsically in a human being that just needs to be brought out and nurtured. That there's something in, that uh, God has given us something in ourselves that needs to be brought out. So it's not just a matter of putting knowledge in or facts in or information in, but of drawing out from the child by virtue of example, by virtue of environment, the right kind of environment that will allow the child to flourish like, and I like to say to people, parents or teachers, as though you're a gardener and this is a, a seed, but it's a mystery seed. You know, you've got a mystery seed, you don't know what it's going to produce, and your job is to create these wonderful conditions for that seed, and then discover about, you know, 15 or 20 years later, what's in it, <laughs> once it finally, you know, manifests itself. Yes. 
And so um, we know that the Quran urges us to reflect on the signs of God all around us, and we should be able to find signs and things and understand that these are all you know, means of knowledge and knowledge connecting us to God, and that this has to do with what we're learning, this, this learning about the world. Okay? This is a beautiful example in the Alamiya preschool, which is a Montessori's preschool in, in East London, of this sense of, uh, it's a Montessori school, a preschool, fostering contemplation, it's showing the beauty, you know, as nature, there's the beauty of, of the harmony of geometry, and that's, that's part of an area in the classroom, and Maria Montessori allowed for, um, she had a silent game, where children would be silent and, and then just have that, you know, quiet breathing and have a chance to contemplate things, and, um, there's also the peace table where children learn how to, to negotiate their own uh, disagreements and come to peace with each other. So these are some of the things that, that happen in Montessori that are intrinsically in the method. Now, there are a number of different Western holistic educational approaches and part of my question or my research in trying to find the one that I felt was most suitable is we discovered that when teachers are trained, um, and they get used to a certain method of teaching, it's very hard for them to change their habits after that. And so they get trained in a particular approach and they get used to that. And it's already hard enough to change a person's worldview if they've gone to a different kind of school when they were a child. But when you want them to teach differently, the idea is what kind of teacher training is going to be fostering that kind of awareness that you want um, to deal with the, the, the Muslim child or in a Muslim school. So. Um, there are a lot of different Western proponents of holistic education. Now, Froebel was the inventor of kindergarten, and it's great to hear Sue Palmer talking about a, a reviving a kindergarten stage, you know, in, in the Scottish curriculum. I quite like Froebel, uh, and I went to Fro you know, the Froebel College is part of my, my alma mater, you know, Fr 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 Roehampton. Um, Rudolf Stein, uh, founder of Waldorf Schools. Charlotte Mason is another one which is very popular with home educators. Um, proposing a broad liberal education in the sense of, of, liberal not in the sense of political liberalism, but in the sense of a very broad education, so introducing the child to the whole world. Um, advocates of classical education that I call neoclassical, and then Maria Montessori. Now, the thing that's distinctive about Maria Montessori is that she was, as mentioned earlier today, a doctor and not a teacher. And so she didn't come up, it was not her mission in life to be a great teacher and come up with this great idea about how to transform schools and to impose her ideas on the world. It was just very accidental that she got involved in education. And in fact, uh, I think it was suggested when she was younger that she should become a teacher because that was an appropriate thing for young girls to do and she did not want to be a teacher. <laughs> Um, she, she was very mathematically inclined, she was very scientific, she was into engineering, and um, she was the first, Italy's first female doctor. And there is a rumor that the application, they thought that she wrote Mario and they let her in or something like that. <laughs> um, anyway, what she was doing, um, I think, let's see if we can go to the next one, I believe. So she was born in 1870 in Italy, um, like I said. Now, as part of what she was doing, she was working with mentally deficient children. Uh, you might call them retarded children. There's different words that have been used over the age. Children with a lower IQ and children who were institutionalized. And in those days, institutions were very bare and they had nothing for children to play with. And uh, she started studying the work of Itzard and Seguin, which is some f French, uh, doctors and educators for mentally deficient children. I think one of them who works with uh, the wild boy of Amignon, something like that. How to educate a child who had not been educated and brought up properly. And it was through this use of very specific physical materials. And so she started using these materials and developing them further and experimenting with them. And she found eventually these, these so-called deficient children were able to pass state exams. Um, she thought, well, if this is what so-called deficient children could accomplish, then what about normal children? And then she became interested in what normal children could do and, and what children's possibilities were generally. And at, at around that time, um, she was given the opportunity to set up an experimental school for children who were in the slums. The mothers were working um, in factories. And, from, and at that point in time, children from around the age of three were left on the street all day and got up to a lot of mischief and basically were tearing the place apart. And he said, you know, I'll give you this big room. <laughs> you know, you, you do something with them and get them off the street and they won't be bothering us. So she discovered that children would become transformed and what she calls normalized, and we can connect that to the idea of the fitra, 
once they had begun to concentrate on a piece of work freely chosen. So we have this idea of choice and of play and of the development of concentration. And what she found was when children could, could choose something that they were interested in, they became, their they had all their attention on it, and that gradually their ability to concentrate would increase. So the sense of concentration, of being able to focus, and there's been some recent studies showing that children get into a flow state, the, the concept of flow state, where you don't, you're not aware of what time it is, you're not really sure if people talk to you, 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 you don't, you know, that not sure that they're talking to you, you're just completely absorbed in your activity. And when the children became absorbed in their activities, then they started becoming responsible, they're calm, they weren't a behavior problem anymore, and so she saw this transformation happening, and she's looking at it from a point of view of a doctor rather than a teacher. Okay, and so over the years, she started developing different kinds of, and trying out different kinds of, you know, what we would call, maybe some parents would call toys, you know, learning toys, but I mean, they're, they're educational resources, and what they could learn with them, and she, she developed a very structured system that's progressively goes from one thing to the other, and for some people who are very creative and artistic types, it looks very, very formal and structured, okay? For other people who are very traditional conservative types, it looks like there's just too much freedom of choice going on in that classroom. <laughs> what are all those kids just doing all these different things at the same time? So you have a, a system which is simultaneously considered by liberals to be too sort of structured and by you know, conservatives to be too sort of liberal, and, and it's not necessarily well understood. And I think there's a problem with that with Montessori, and there's also a problem that there's no official you know, organization that has trademarked this name Montessori. So what you will actually find in different schools and classrooms can be widely different, you know, because people can just use the term Montessori and actually not be offering an authentic Montessori experience. So let's, let's talk about what's an authentic experience. Okay, there's certain key features um, that uh, you can say if you find them in a school calling itself Montessori, that um, these are the features that are essential to her method. And that you have a prepared environment, that the classroom itself is very calm, there's simple things, beautiful things, it's very orderly, the child can put, they know exactly where everything belongs. Uh, it tends to be very a natural environment, use of natural materials, okay? Not a lot of exciting colors and things going on. The, the, so the walls are not plastered with stuff everywhere. There's not all kinds of things going on. There's not a lot of distraction going on. And because there's less distraction going on, the children can actually focus you know, more easily on what is to be learned. And then what is to be learned is presented in a very step-by-step -step fashion so they can easily master one little bit at a time and move on to the next bit. And these are things that have been found to be very helpful for children learning, generally speaking, okay? So there's that calm in the classroom. The classroom should be peaceful if you walk in. It can be quite busy, but it should be a sense of, there shouldn't be that sense of strife or of the teacher trying to you know, enforce her will over the class because she's got to shout to keep them quiet because they're all being very naughty or being very you know, disorderly. But the sense of the children are actually quite you know, settled. They're doing work, but it's productive work. Uh, it's creative work, and she's guiding them, or there might be a few teachers in the room, but it's all just progressing very nicely, okay? Um, the homely environment, the child-oriented children's house. I mean, it, it, you know, when Maria Montessori came and started teaching, you know, the, the average classroom, you, you, if you were a young child, your feet were dangling from the, the chair. All the class, you know, the furniture was the same size. And she came up with the idea of making child-sized furniture. I mean, at least that was something that was a trademark of her method. And that was quite radically new for people. That, you know, it, the, you know, there was a kind of a standard size of chair, and then when you got old enough, you, you went to school because you could sit in it or, or something like that. You know, or you were short, you just suffered while your feet dangled or something. So the idea of making a, a kind of a home for children, not just a house, but really a home uh, where they could feel that they are comfortable, they feel confident, they can take care of things, and they were being introduced to how to take care of the environment, and it was their classroom, you know, as a collective group, it's their classroom, they're taking, they're taking care of it. So they have to take care, they have to water the plants, they have to dust, they have to sweep, they have to wipe off the tables, and if they have a day-long day program, then children as young as three and four will be serving lunch, and they'll be cleaning up, and they'll be, you know, washing dishes and all sorts. So, and they'll learn how to brush their hair and they brush their teeth, and you think, well, am I sending my, money, my child to school and paying all this money for the child to learn how to brush their teeth and brush their, you know, but, I mean, the idea is that you're creating this environment where the child is learning how to connect, firstly, when they're quite young, with, the, with their physical needs, and then as they get past that, they become more sociable, and they want to do things in groups together, and so that's that progression, it's a natural progression. So, the careful observation of each child at each plane of development, and that is quite similar to what we would say, and Sue was talking about, attunement or tuning in. 
So the teacher, rather than imposing the same curriculum on everyone at all at the same moment, is tuning in to the needs of each child. Okay? And that's why I find it a more Islamic method, because children, in fact, although there are general trends in how they develop, each individual child is different. And if you have a teacher who's going to tune into each child as an individual, you know, without a preconceived bunch of holes you have to fit into, like the lower, middle, and higher group, or like, you know, one of the four temperaments, or like a particular notion they have of a child, if they're just observing the actual child, then they're going to be able to respond to the needs of that child. So then the child is going to be challenged at the right rate. They're not going to be, it's not going to be too difficult, it's not going to be too easy. The, the, the teacher will be able to move that child onto the right piece of work with the right amount of challenge that's just right for that child. Because the fact is that everyone's different. And the problem of education in any kind of classroom setting is that you can never get it right for each individual child because there's these different children, you know, one is great, they're two years ahead in math and two years behind in, you know, in reading and they're sort of they're interested in science but they're also good at art. And you can't ever get them all sorted. You've got a class of 25 or 30 children, what can you do? And so normally what you do is you teach to the middle. They can, people can say whatever they want, but the fact is that the pressure of the situation, the pressure of the time and everything, and no matter how much emphasis there is on differentiation and all of that, in the end, you've got to just focus on the average child in the class because you can't manage it in a normal system. This is a system which allows you to focus on each child by giving the children more responsibility for their own learning. And the child actually is the one who best knows whether they know it or not. <laughs> I mean, you can make as many tests as you want, you can test them all year, but the child really always knows whether they know it or not. Okay? And that's the genius of the method. So it's more efficient. You have a greater efficiency in time because if you, and, and the child is already naturally born wanting to know things, wanting to learn. So it, it's, it's harnessing and keeping that love of learning, which should be intrinsic and inherent in the child, by giving them interesting things to be able to find out about, and eventually they're going to learn it all. They might, you know, not every single thing, but they're going to master quite a lot of it, okay? Because they find it interesting. The objects are interesting. It's all, uh, no one's correcting them with lots of red pen all the time because they can discover on their own whether they're right or wrong. You don't need to get the teacher's attention all the time because um, you can find out whether you've got it right or wrong. So yes, there is a role for the teacher definitely, and the teacher is the role model in the classroom. But um, the teacher is, uh, is able to teach because a lot of the problem of behavior has been solved because the child can move around, they can choose activities, they can choose which order they do the activities, they have a work plan, they have a, a work cycle. So the, the child feels empowered, the child feels confident, the child is happy, the child is not bothering anybody. They get a bit restless, they stand up, they change their material, they get something else. They don't create a behavior problem. Because when you're trying to teach all the children the same thing at the same time, oftentimes it does not work. And they develop very sophisticated uh, techniques for pretending that they're following the lesson. <laughs> That's what children develop, right? We know that. <laughs> they look like they're interested, but actually they're doing something completely different because it's not interesting them. So they're not gonna learn that thing, whatever that thing is. So, okay. You have the teacher facilitating or coaching the children, guiding them on the side. Yes, they do presentations and they're also an authority, but a lot of the times they're, they're a friendly guide you know, they're like a kind of a, a mother in the classroom or something like that, Teach, you know, bring them to the next thing, the good mother. Um, and then you have a multi-age class with one-to-one -one and small group teaching and occasionally some group teaching, whole group teaching as well. Personally, at Menara, we always had a balance between what I feel is necessary amount of sort of whole class teaching with then one-on-one -on -one and small group teaching. Now, it's very important to have a multi-age class. And some Montessori elementary schools or primary schools will have all the children from age 6 to 12 in one class. But that is actually quite demanding on the teacher. And these days, with the way children are developing physically, oftentimes they might be talking about things that would be inappropriate by the age of 11 or 12 you know, for the 6-year-olds. So it's more typically or more commonly developed into a 6 to 9-year-old class and a 9 to 12-year-old class. Okay? And the teacher or teachers would be able to teach that range of ages. Sometimes you have teachers working with each other and they say, well, I'll take humanities and you take, you know, math and science or whatever it is, you know, so that there are different people working with their expertise. But this immediately reduces the competitive nature of the class. Okay, so they're not feeling like, oh, I'm in the low group, I'm in the slow group, because they might be, in, you know, a bit behind in something, but they're a bit ahead in something else. And maybe it's just because they're younger, because there's older kids in the class than me. And um, I'm going to be six in that class, and so everyone will be older than me, but then I'm going to be nine, and I'll be the older one helping out the younger ones. 
And there's also that long-term relationship between the child and the teacher. And if you're fortunate enough to keep your teachers for those three years and not have them go somewhere else, or, or go off on maternity leave, or move to another country, then you will have a, a class where the children have known the teacher for three years, and so they've got that, that well-developed relationship with the teacher, which we're talking about in the importance of relationships and long-term relationships. And um, the teacher also knows the child very well. And, and anyone who's taught will know that it takes such a period of time to get to know your new class in September. And if you have to do that over and over again, year after year, it just takes quite a while. And if you already know them, then it, you're making progress. Th things are good. Only a third of your class is changing. The other two thirds you still know. So that's quite an advantage. Okay. And then there's an emphasis on the community aspect, uh, especially from the age six and onwards. This caring, respectful community, we're showing respect for one another, we have to take turns, we're, you know, we're, we're responsible as a group for something, for our classroom, for our materials. And specifically, there is something called grace and courtesy lessons. So this is part of the Montessori curriculum, as long, along with f uh, family life, uh, along with practical life. So, you know, children will actually practice, you know, serving uh, tea and, and uh, uh, answering the telephone. And this is part of the curriculum of, you know, how to grow up and be a nice person, a polite person, have good manners. And so the fact that these things are ingrained in the curriculum, I think, makes your job easier as a Muslim educator. Okay? And there's a fostering of love of learning and of love of work. Um, because there's this emphasis on intrinsic motivation of the child to learn something, which is something the child is born with naturally, rather than the extrinsic reward system. There's no rewards in a Montessori school. There's no gold stars, there's no stickers, there's no names of good children up on the board, or anything like that, or names of naughty children up on the board, <laughs> okay, as the case may be. So there's no naming and shaming. All of that doesn't happen. So there's this sense of, we, you know, and if you do a good piece of work, we want the child to know they've done a good piece of work on their own. They can look at the work and say, you know, I really did it. This is, this is my best work so far. Or I think I could really improve on that. So it's more that taking responsibility rather than being completely dependent on another person to make an evaluation. Okay? Um, we found that children gain in confidence tremendously while still being respectful to adults and, with, and to others. Because they're not feeling, and I've had a lot of children come from a home education background or from state schools where every five minutes they want to show you their work. Is it good miss? Is it good miss? Is it good miss? <laughs> because they're completely dependent on the teacher for their whole sense of well, worth and well-being and, and, and everything. And so that sense of being able to develop self-evaluation leads to that self-control, that self-management, time management, so this is actually what's required of the modern workplace as a person who is a self-initiated, self-starter, proactive person that can get along with other people in their, their workplace. And they don't need to continually go to the boss and ask, you know, what do I do next, what do I need to do next? You know, they need to be able to move on and, and do the next thing and know what that is. And so that is building that sense of responsibility. Um, in the Muslim tradition, we have this, you know, we know that children are baligh, they reach puberty, they should be responsible for their actions. But in modern day society, there's actually no mechanism by which children can learn responsibility normally. The average modern day child goes to school and spends all day in school, and if they're a Muslim child and they live in England, they spend all the evening in the madrasa, they're told what to do from morning to night, they have no responsibilities at home, they hardly speak to their family, and uh, they have no chores, they don't take care of animals anymore. What are they going to do? How are they going to learn to be responsible? They have no choices. They're just dictated to from morning to night. So you're not going to get a responsible child in that circumstance. They have to have a means by which to become responsible. And that is by giving them you know, increasing amounts of responsibility from when they're young, from when they can handle it. Okay? Next. So, here are some photos from our uh, school, which this is from 2011, so learning in a homely environment, you know, the children are sitting on the floor, the teacher's, you know, very friendly, and there's a small group, and she's doing a demonstration, so that's one, one kind of impression you can get. Next. Collaborative learning, this emphasis on collaboration rather than competition, okay, that every child should just compete with themselves to do their best, okay, next. The children's house, you can see this is a lovely example from Florida of just a really beautiful classroom. The classroom is beautiful, it's tidy, it looks like home. It looks very comfortable, it's very inviting. Okay, they've got lots of space there. Next. Well, they're sharing care of the environment, tidying up, doing litter picking. So this is some of the things that, you know, they, they're expected to be responsible and take initiative. Uh, next. 
there's an, you know, this, this one on one time with the child, with the teacher, you know, the, the child can confide in the teacher and they have that lovely conversation. You know, when you're working with small groups of children or with children one on one, you can have a very relaxed kind of conversation. And what, but when you're standing in front of a class of 25 children, you have to be more formal and more distant. The numbers sort of make it imperative that you, you assert more authority over the class. You don't get that, that same free flow between yourself and the child as you do when you can work one-on-one. -on -one. And what enables you to do that is that you're training the children to work independently. So while other children are doing their work independently, you can then work, move around the classroom, you know, either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups and teach one group, you know, about isosceles triangles, and the other one's about, you know, the parts of speech and, and whatever it is that they're up to at the moment, yeah? And then they have a plan which they're going to tick off, oh, I've done this, I've done my grammar, I've done my spelling, so those are the parts I don't really like. So now I can sit and spend an hour reading because I have done all of my work, yeah? And so what we found is that as soon as we got the children to that point where they know how to do the things separately on their own, then they would, be, they would go through speedily, you know? Oh, you know it, instead of spending 45 minutes dragging out on the grammar, you know, they would do it in 10 or 15 minutes. They would do another thing in another 10 or 15 minutes because they knew at the end, the reward would be that they could do the things that they want to do. Because they've done, you know, they've done the writing for the day, they've done the, you know, the, the reading for the day, and now I can have fun, I can play you know, games, I can play educational games, I can play science games. My, we can, I can go in the corner with my friend and, and, and play something about the classification of animals, which is, you know, is actually fun, or Scrabble or something like that. Okay, go further. Learning to be responsible. Here are some children working together on woodworking and using a saw. Next. Okay, so here we go with the rest of them, and I'll try to speed through them because apparently I'm very slow. <laughs> okay, so the idea of respecting the child. Well, well, Muslim parents will sometimes have a, an issue with this. What does it mean, respecting the child? But it means that really, I think, understanding that the child is going to be an adult and that whatever you're doing is going to have an impression on them and that they have in, inner God-given gifts and abilities. And rather than, for instance, saying, well, you almost become doctors, or, or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> just understand that everyone has their intrinsic interest and that if you leave children alone, just like if we don't do anything to interfere, we're naturally going to end up with 50% boys and 50% girls in the world, you know. And if you leave everything alone, you'll also have just the right number of sort of bakers and artists and mathematicians and scientists. Because this is something that has come into, you know, it's in, in, in the child. You, you can't, we can't all be doctors, right? or lawyers, but there can be a, a good percentage of just the right numbers of each. And I believe that if you trust to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that it will just come out, it will just be manifest, you know? Okay, the child is an active learner, they're using real objects, they're getting their flow state, they're self-teaching some things, not everything. A lot of the materials are self-correcting, so they'll know if they do it right or wrong. They don't, it, it, this is a great reduction in, in marking work for the teacher, I have to say, <laughs> it's a real plus, okay? They have a free choice of structured activities. So it's not a free choice of anything, it's a free choice of structured activities that are going to learn, the child will learn as a result of, okay? So the reliance on intrinsic motivation. Then you have a context, you're, you're providing a great, an, a grand narrative through what we call the great lessons and key lessons so that all these bits of information about science like astronomy or, or about geography are contextualized in a story and the story engages the imagination of the child so it's very interesting. We can talk maybe more about great lessons later. There is an acceptance of cultural diversity and the sense of purpose and destiny, this cosmic education. So overall as a system, although if you're, an, if you're an individual parent and you say, well, I've got a Steiner school there, or I've got a Froebel school there, or should I go to the state school? I would certainly say I would prefer the Froebel school or the Steiner school over the state school because there's more of this awareness and there's a lot of overlap. But if you ask me, as a Muslim community, shall we start, what kind of school shall we start? I would advise you, based on the, the um, overlap and the, you know, the understanding of the child and the development, I would advise you, if you're going to train as a teacher, if you're going to start a school, I would advise you to start a Montessori school. Yeah? Especially, you know, okay. Um, I think we may just have to go to questions after that. What have we got? Have we got some more photos? Let's, let's see if there's more photos after that. More children in the classroom working on the Africa puzzle. They're getting their concentration. The willpower, the idea of not interrupting the child is not because the child is the master, but the child needs to develop their concentration. If you have a child that can work for two hours or three hours without needing any input from the teacher and being completely engaged in learning, you have a great future for that child, let me tell you. <laughs> 
that, that child could accomplish all sorts. You know, you want to get the child to be able to focus on something, and then they could, they, then they're going to be interested. And they're going to have like a, a multi-level plan. They're going to work on a project. They're going to work on, you know, global warming. They're going to work on, I don't know. Um, you know, something interesting for like six weeks because they'd start developing that. And they can, they can, that, that's a researcher of the future because they've got that interest and they're carrying it on. And every child does their own project. So you have a great, you know, you have a, say the story of maths. You're teaching that is one of the great lessons. And then you've got one child making a Chinese abacus and you've got another child that's decided to create money for the school. Monara money. <laughs> you got another child, you know, they've come up with all sorts of things, you know. You give them free riding, free riding, and I, I had children copying the periodic table of the elements in a free riding time, and I thought, this is amazing. <laughs> and I had another group of children, they were making up stories, like an action-adventure story about um, positive and negative ions and, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, because they had gotten really interested in, in the periodic table and the atoms and, you know, they had created this whole story. So it, the things that they get interested in, if you give them the freedom that they develop it, you know, we've had science fair projects and the things that people, you know, what is the aurora borealis, you know, children that are eight-year-olds or, you know, what is a rainbow or what is fire, things that are not on the curriculum. They're not going to be in the curriculum. Okay, because you would not have thought of that question <laughs> as a teacher, but the child would think of the question. Yeah. What is the anti-kithera mechanism? Or, you know, what are the workings of the Porsche engine? These are the kind of things <laughs> that we were getting from children when you allow them to choose their own project. Okay? And a lot of these children were from deprived communities, so-called deprived low-income areas, but they had just been given that environment and that inspiration, they had the right kind of teachers engaged, and they were into it. And so, you know, children very confident, very enthusiastic, happy to be at school. Okay? Happy parents, happy children. Okay, then. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Fascinating. I, I suppose I particularly resonated with um, your distinction between Islamic education in the sense of that which is based on an Islamic philosophy. That's right. And what normally passes as Islamic school, which is often the opposite. Yeah. Um, so you end up with a, a Montessori school, which is more Islamic than or certainly the typical madrasa. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, a really vital distinction. Mm -hmm. And um, as I'll talk to you later of um, work looking at extracting the educational principles in the Ikhya, yeah. Ghazali's work, mm -hmm. um, which resonates very much with what you've been saying.